so hello. Uh, I'm Kasper Schipper. Uh, I'm from Utrecht, uh, the Netherlands, but I'm also very, um, uh, yeah, I have a history with zoology as well because I studied there. Uh, I'm currently still involved with uh, the Game of Life, uh, which is uh, um, basically the, the owner of a mobile WFS uh, uh, system of uh, consisting of uh, uh, 192 loudspeakers uh, over here. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to speak too much about that because that would take another. Uh, then we would run out of time for sure. Um, but if you ever in near the Hague or or in the the Randstad uh, in the in the Netherlands and you would like to visit this system, then contact me and happy to to play you some uh, some of that stuff. That's really uh, exciting. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit more about my own uh, kind of uh, struggles. Uh, it's not such a very academic research. It's more kind of like practically. I want to do certain. Uh, since these things and I, I run into to, uh, blockades or, or issues or, uh, and yeah this is sort of started already when I was studying but uh, I, 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 since I finished I still continue uh, uh, doing with this. So yeah since being in The Hague I, I was very uh, uh, inspired and, and kind of thought uh, the, uh, the uh, Paul Berg uh, um, non-standard synthesis kind of strategies. Um, and we were specifically taught the AC toolbox, uh, which is kind of scheme or actually this based uh, algorithmic uh, toolbox. Um, and somehow, probably because it's the first thing I learned that still sort of is a, in my brain a sort of reference that I, I somehow try to reproduce it, uh, even though it has some kind of um, uh, strange uh, um, interface. Um, um, and there's actually some. Ah. So, yeah, below there should be Luke Dobreiner, uh, who's my other inspiration. He was just uh, doing his master when I was a bachelor student, and he uh, wrote a program called Comp Scheme, um, which was also able to do a kind of non standard uh, synthesis uh, using Lisp, uh, probably inspired by the same kind of uh, context as myself. And um, yeah, I, I thought that was a really nice program, but I, I just couldn't get my mind around understanding it because at that point I was not so far in programming, and that was really uh, uh, programmed in OCaml and, and quite an, uh, an advanced system. But its concepts he explained very well in, in his uh, thesis, so I, I, that, that uh, I found very inspiring. Um, Soundwise, yeah, I, I really like this idea of not having any concept of oscillators or filters or kind of high abstract uh, things, but just generating values and writing them to the DAC. So that's sort of <coughs> similar to the fascination John talked about. Uh, and one example I, I, I also found that triggered my, my imagination is Michael Chinon's uh, fucking web browser, as he called it. Uh, and it's a web browser that uh, basically uh, renders its own memory state uh, directly to the DAC. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think you can install it anymore. Um, but for, he did uh, make a. Um, uh, so now I have the problem probably with the same. No. Is fucking. <laughs> That's my presentation. <laughs> Some sound is coming. Yeah, the sound is there, so that's not so It looks more like it's your internet connection. Yeah, yeah the two. Okay, okay. so there it is. Yeah. I somehow really like these, these type of sounds and, and wanted to, uh, to somehow compose with them. Um, 
So, and yeah, that never, I mean, uh, before Chuck, I was using C sound and, and uh, Python scripts, but <coughs> yeah, Python is kind of slow. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, still I could do some things, but uh, but really Chuck was kind of the first uh, eureka moment or something uh, for me that made it a lot easier to achieve this kind of uh, synthesis thing. Uh, so is there anybody else here that has used Chuck? So it's kind of a radical thing, I realize. It's, it's, it's not that uh, much, which is weird because it's actually one of the few languages which uh, apart from all its kind of strange limitations that it has, um, it has, no uh, and it, it has uh, a lot of okay, so I've heard a few people complaining because it clicks all the time. Oh, really? Mm, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So to, to very briefly sell this to the <laughs> to the heretics. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it, it is basically a very simple language, and now it's it's very small font. Uh, this should work. Um, so yeah, it has the usual um, kind of uh, Eugen uh, stuff. Okay, that is kind of boring. We can ignore that for now. Um, but what I really like about it is that you have an impulse generator. Uh, and you can connect it like this, so this is kind of a, uh, just a way of, uh, of, of making an input generator and, and connecting it to your DAC. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the core of it is really that the, the, the programming language itself um, runs with the kind of um, uh, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it runs without some kind of control rate. Uh, so you can actually, um, um, I mean, I could just say this, and then say next, this one, so. And what this means is actually this, this kind of, this one second to now is actually, uh, you could translate it as sleep for one second or wait for one second and then do something. So your whole program can be timed uh, very exactly. And uh, what is kind of different, I think, from most languages is that it, it really is one second. It's not just like one second and some vector size or one second or maybe an email came in and it waits for this email to... <laughs> that it's really accurate, so that's nice. And, uh, accurate, accurate to the sample, no? Huh? Accurate to the sample. Yes, exactly. So that's the point. So, I mean, although it can uh, do once per second, I mean, you can also just do... Um, um, uh, like that. Um, so this just takes a random number between 1 and 100, and that is actually the, the difference between my sem se uh, between my filters. <coughs> and so I should have made some... Yeah. So that would work, and I mean, you can even do it uh, like that. Um, you ah, but, yeah, okay. okay, that doesn't work, but um, basically, you can write any type of code within this kind of one sample loop. So, a lot of my programs just c consist of this, of this one simple step. And then I have objects that generate the, the, the values. Um, so moving back. Um, and yeah, this is very attractive because it makes it a lot easier because you don't have to deal with C or with vector sizes or um, with all this kind of stuff. You can uh, just write your program in a relatively uh, simple language, which looks a bit like Java, but is actually, yeah, it's a little bit less verbose, <laughs> fortunately, than Java, but it's kind of, for simple programs, it's acceptable. Um, and uh, yeah, so my basic uh, concept was just to have amplitude and time, and, uh, and I had um, mm -hmm. uh, to make that a bit easier to not have to constantly reprogram everything, and it kind of... Uh, a library with stream objects so that you can um, 
uh, yeah, uh, and that, that I took actually from the Toberinus prompt scheme. Uh, so stream object is just some kind of iterator, so you can ask it for next values. And you can also construct a stream, for instance, from other streams, like a sum two streams, or for instance, have a stream and then have the other stream uh, control how much that stream is repeated, uh, uh, something that loops a stream. I mean, basically something like like Eugen's in a sense, but then for uh, discrete values and not so much a signal. Um, so yeah, I did that in Chuck for quite a while. Um, but the issue was that uh, at some point it starts to get very verbose um, and even though I have a lot of classes and I try to keep my class name short, um, it would still um, uh, result in this kind of syntax that was just not pretty. And uh, yeah, I don't know, I think I, I would make a case that, that somehow syntax is important. Um, uh, just because, at least for myself, I found that, um, yeah, I just find it easier to to rewrite my programs when they're not too um, uh, too noisy in their in their in their visual layout. Um, and also, yeah, just when when I'm making uh, this type of uh, non-standard uh, programs, I mean, I often have to make large arrays of numbers, and just having to type in even the commas between the numbers, I, I find kind of annoying. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I was quite early already suggested uh, by Richard Barrett that I should just write my own language and I thought this was a, yeah, just like a suggestion that I found very dangerous because you know, that if I would do that it would take me uh, a very long time and, and I was just like, yeah, and then I have to learn what parsers are and all this kind of stuff. Um, but then later I went to a, a meetup of uh, Creative Coding Utrecht. Um, which is a very nice group. It's actually larger than the Amsterdam group nowadays, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, but, uh, actually Rick Arns was, was in an Amsterdam uh, meeting. I mean, they are uh, kind of twins uh, because they, are, they have been organized by the, the, the same uh, people. Uh, and Rick Arns, he actually, uh, uh, he's not an audio person. He's actually more interested in web uh, GL. Uh, and uh, he, but he showcased a um, kind of live coding environment for doing graphics on the in the browser, but uh, using a kind of simple JavaScript uh, language, uh, and it sort of translates all to native or not native, but um, but WebGL, this kind of WebGL uh, code, which would normally be very uh, kind of brain meltingly uh, annoying to write, but with him it was kind of really easy. And uh, he even wrote his own text editor within the browser using this kind of thing. And I thought, well, okay, this is indeed even more insane than writing your own language to do non-standard synthesis. Um, but I also thought he seems relatively happy with doing this kind of thing. <laughs> so I thought maybe I should just try to write something, to fake it basically, to fake a language. And I thought because in a way, I mean, he was also just um, translating JavaScript to, to some other higher language. So I started to realize that maybe this parsing doesn't need to be mean that you have to really, you know, translate to some kind of uh, assembly code or this type of stuff that it can, it can be faked somehow. So then I started this Sys program. Um, and yeah, it is sort of inspired by this, uh, by functional programming in the sense that it has these, uh, uh, some, some concept from functional programming, although I would say it's probably the most Theoretical uh, <laughs> implementation of those concepts ever, because there's state everywhere. I don't know. Is there any really functional programming Haskell expert here? <laughs> no. So maybe I'm not in, <laughs> in danger of being. A <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Faust is also functional, of course, but yeah, I'm not an expert. yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and I based it, I found this very nice uh, little scheme interpreter uh, written in Python, which is just uh, one page. And that was also the kind of yeah size of parser I could still understand. And it was just translating um, a very little scheme kind of program into uh, just the Python code. And it was a very, a very nice example. And basically that just formed the core of my translator. Um, 
Yeah, and that really, I mean, that blew up. I mean, I was surprised how, how actually how powerful it can be to just have a very simple uh, translator for my input and then translate it into some uh, kind of things. And you get so much kind of nice things for free uh, once you, you go that, uh, that route. Um, um, and yeah, you're sort of free to, to have your own kind of weird, weird dialect. So maybe. Wait, D rate you mean? Like demand regions? That's not D rate. Yeah, this, I mean, the concept is kind of demand rate mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, um, because of those streams that I also used before I was even using this uh, translator, uh, I mean, they are all only asked for values if they are really used. So that means that uh, if I have some array of these streams and I only use one, then the other ones are not updated. So it's a, it's it's relatively efficient. I mean, I, it needs to be because Chuck is not. I mean, of course, because it doesn't have a vector or all this kind of thing. It, it's not uh, it's not the fastest uh, audio language ever. Um, but yeah, that's the, the the price you pay. So just to show a little bit what this then uh, uh, looks like. So basically my language looks like this and I have some uh, step generator which then takes an amplitude stream and a time stream. So and yeah the kind of simplest program I can write, it's, it's not a double pulse but it's a, <laughs> it's a square wave, it happens to be. Uh, I don't know what, what conclusions Dick would, uh, would take from that. But uh, so yeah, let's just go for it. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll use the program of the way. Um, yeah, and then I have some script that uh, that that just takes this this and uh, chucks it into Chuck, so to say. And then there's silence, of course. Why? <coughs> ah, there's no sound. I do actually hear sound. It's coming out of my speakers. So let me just uh, do it again. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's fascinating of course, but it might get boring after a few months. Uh, so yeah, I mean, one of the things I found very important in, in language is that any kind of number value can be replaced with a function relatively painlessly. Um, so um, maybe what would be fun? Let's do a spark. Or maybe let's do a really classic one. Um, but then So what it basically does is this, this generates an array of uh, 32 values between minus 1 and 1. And then the index here is a, is a stream that takes an array and an indexer and then just returns values. So I can now write something that makes the indexer. So yeah, I think you can already see that I also really like this kind of short letter uh, thing that uh, that um, Till showed in this, uh, this steno. Um, so let's have a line. So a line is a, a function that takes uh, something that generates uh, values and then the time it takes to get to that next point. So this, yeah, the AC2 box fans will <laughs> recognize names and, and things. Um, so now I need to, let's be more exact, actually, I should probably do this. Uh, yeah. 
So this is actually a tendency mask, basically. Um, and uh, one edit, so let's first see if this runs. Yeah. Okay. So now it gets more show the, the thing that fascinates me most at the moment. Um, if I can find it. Yeah, so this is a... Um, so one thing that really fascinates me are blocks, uh, which I get, you could also call this iterative function. So they take a value, uh, then they go through a set of conditions, and if the condition matches, it applies a operator to that value. So you can, for instance, in this example, uh, I, I start with 100, and then if it's, if the, well, and that, that's my starting value. And then I go through all the comparisons, so I look at, uh, uh, well, if it's smaller than 10, then maybe I multiply it with 2 or 3. Uh, if it's bigger than 10,000, then I will divide it by 2 or 3. And else I will do something else. Um, and you can, of course, yeah, you can make quite complex uh, uh, comparison and things like this. Uh, but it's kind of walk that, that checks at each step what to do next. Um, and uh, yeah, because there are also various ways of, for instance, uh, well, this morning already was discussed the fun you can have with buffers, especially if you take some complex function that looks at the whole buffer state or does something interesting with the buffer and then uh, decides its next step based on that, that can, can get quite, uh, quite interesting results. Um, so yeah, this is actually just a test, uh, so it generates values like this. Maybe this is the final thing. We can play this thing, but I think yes, that does need some tables.
<laughs> but yeah, uh, just maybe skip to my conclusions <laughs> fast. Uh, yeah, this is some of the other stuff we can do. So yeah, well, the, the, the kind of lesson from this is, I mean, I don't know if this language, I mean, it is on GitHub if you want to check it out and, and want to have a look. Uh, it is a bit my own personal thing. I did try to write a readme that sort of takes you through all the steps you need to do to get it uh, running. Um, but yeah, it's uh, uh, the, my main uh, kind of message that I want to, to, to spread to this is that parsers and translates are, are not so difficult to write, actually. I found it surprisingly uh, easy and, and you get even with a very stupid, badly done translator can be really powerful too. Um, uh, yeah, I mean the the <coughs> fact that it's slow, the chip is slow. I mean for me is sometimes a problem, but yeah, it has been okay for now. Um, yeah, and that that kind of having generic tools. For instance, with this last example, this walk, for instance, th those are the most interesting because then you can really take, um, can sort of each value can be re replaced by another small program, so it's, it it makes it more modular. And I find, for instance, in some of the demand rate stuff at SuperCollider, that it's sometimes you can just you can set a lot of things, but for instance, not what a walk does at the boundary conditions, or it's just this. Like this final step that would take it, make it more powerful, and somehow maybe that would be interesting also to try and extend extend these demand regions with the ideas that I've developed in this uh, in this thing. <coughs> um, but anyway, that is what I wanted to say. Now. So, yes, any questions? Yes. Guess what I'm saying. I would say, coffee break, <laughs> getting smaller and smaller, but uh, if somebody wants to... I mean, is there any, I mean, sort of, I wondered, I'm, I developed most of this completely on my own, I mean, is this insane, or is this useful, <laughs> or... It's very personal. I, sometimes it's very personal, for sure, but, uh, but uh, yeah, that's a bit of a danger, because uh, I think it can also be nice to be part of a shared group, and... And uh, sometimes we waste a lot of time solving some problem that probably somebody else could solve in, uh, mm. in, in no time. Um, mm. But yeah, I've, I've been thinking maybe to, to, to uh, yeah. I mean, Chuck is sort of uh, a strange part in this at this moment because I'm just generating streams of floats. So it could also be translated to C or something, but I'm a little bit hesitant somehow. <laughs> Sorry, but I should. Sorry, I missed a little bit. But do you have maybe like some tutorials uh, on, on or documentation of how to use everything? I've I've made some videos of yeah. what I do. Uh, there is a README file, um, and also I push every program I write is pushed to the to the to the Git of mm. the project. Mm. So there's a lot of programs. And some of them are very simple, so they're probably quite easy to follow. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm planning to make more examples and sort of post just ideas, because I think the ideas might be interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, three questions. Yes, let's go. But just one quick comment. Uh, for anyone who's like uh, intimidated, interested in this kind of project, but intimidated by it, yes. the tool, like nobody really writes real JavaScript anymore. Everyone's kind of writing kind of meta compiled. Yeah. Stuff. And so the tools for doing this kind of like rewriting of JavaScript these days are like insanely powerful and really easy okay. to use. Uh -huh. So if anyone's like interested in this, that, that world is actually like, it's quite easy to just like jump in in an afternoon and do kind of weird little mini languages in JavaScript. Okay, so, and do you have any example maybe? Of, What's up? Any example of that? Um, the, of the one, uh, I mean, Babel is the main thing that yeah, people okay. use, but there's a, like, if you look at Babel, there's like a million different tools that all spring off from that and go into it that are like different ways of reparsing and reloading yeah. JavaScript. It's just like, I really recommend, if, yeah, if the, you ever have an like, afternoon, I mean, write a little parser because it's really, it's fun mm -hmm. and, and it can be very it's, musical. It's, it's really a very good, musical thing to do it. So, yeah. Then, because I was first afraid that I would just, you know, be reading <coughs> parsers and reading books on parsers or something, but it's not like that. It's, 
It's mm -hmm. quite musical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. No, just uh, it's about Chuck. Uh, uh, yeah. How precise it is with timing. Like if you have one millisecond at forty-four thousand one hundred, which is a fraction of yes. number of samples. <laughs> how does it handle this? Uh, it 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 uh, so it synchronizes with the sample, but you can have timings within a sample, but it doesn't interpolate the so impulse. So it will play it will the next round up to forty-four samples. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can take Just a high sample risk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.